and it needs to work there. And we can talk later about what you do when they get to middle grades and high school, but right now we gotta concentrate on the neighborhood elementary school. Okay, that's the, that's the uh, third lesson. Fourth lesson, the district, not the school, must be the focus of attention and responsibility for solving this problem. There are a million reasons why this is true, but just think about this. You're a teacher in a neighborhood school. You've been there 20 years. When you started out, the school was, uh, let's say, 30% white working class and 70% black working class. Okay, it's now 20 years later. That school, there are no white working class left. The school is 40% black working class, 60% Latino. You don't speak Spanish. You don't have a bilingual program in your school. You now have a bunch of kids who have come to the United States, most of them with parents who are there probably illegally, from rural Mexico or rural Honduras or the Dominican Republic, which is the three major contributors of immigrants to the United States now, who have, maybe they walk in when they're nine years old. Maybe they've had three or four months of schooling in Spanish. Their parents are semi-literate or illiterate in Spanish. There are no books at home, there are no magazines, there are no, there's nothing to read at home because their parents can't read in Spanish. And you're expected to prepare them to pass and test in the English language within two years. Now can you think of anything that would be harder than that? And why do you think that we should pass that problem along to the principal of the school or the teachers in that school to solve. It's impossible. They don't have the time or resources or knowledge to solve that problem. The district has got to take that problem on. The state introduces a, 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 a gazillion new academic standards and binders that thick with frameworks about how to teach those standards. Do you think that the teachers and principals at any one of these neighborhood schools have the time to go through a document that thick written with very vague standards frequently, or too general standards, or too specific standards, and figure out what that means for their class this week of April 11th or whatever it is? No, I don't think you could do, expect that. The district should, has to take the leadership on that. We've got a new federal law, No Child Left Behind, that imposes lots of requirements on schools. They gotta have all the, do you think that they can take all of this change that's going on and figure it out at the school level? Impossible, absolutely impossible. Crazy to talk about that. Yeah, we keep talking about schools being the place where the reform has got to take place. We don't talk about what it means for the district. We need to talk about that. That's a bureaucratic thing, but it's important in getting to a solution. Fifth lesson, start early. One minute, two minutes, all right. I'll violate that. To uh, start early, I, the reason for that is now clear. It, and when we say that the start has to be with a high quality preschool, what we mean is that you gotta spend some money. You wanna have a certified teacher who's been trained to deal with young kids. This is, a, this is art and craft and science combined into a job legislators, editorial writers, uh, politicians in general rebel at the idea that it would be expensive to educate a three-year-old. You know, there's no physics involved. What are you talking about? They're not learning algebra. What, what's so hard about this? And it, it's very important that it be high quality. Otherwise, it's just daycare for a lot of money. It's got to be preschool high quality preschool. And you have, to, you have to start as early as you can get the kids. Six, don't give up on young kids. We talked earlier, I mentioned earlier about this fourth grade horror number. If you don't make it by fourth grade, you're not gonna make it. Think about that, you're, these are nine and 10 year old kids, five, six, seven year old kids. You can't give up on them because we have a lot of information about where they should be chronologically in the years that they're in the primary grades, and you gotta make sure that they're where they need to be. So that means you have to spend more time with them if they're struggling. 
You have to have a system for finding out where they are. And when they show that they're not up to speed, you've got to spend whatever time it takes to get them up to speed. That means teachers have got to stay after school or come in before school or use their lunch hour. And that's got to be a part of it because these kids are not going to get another chance. And so that has to be a part of it. So don't give up on kids. Seven, I'm getting there, Jim. Use a lot of evidence. Keep, keep collecting information. How are they doing? Why aren't they doing better? What are we going to do to make sure they do better? That's got to be the question that everybody asks every day. And that's what good teachers do every day. They keep saying, why doesn't Jimmy get this? Let's try it this way, Jimmy. Have you thought about this? They keep hypothesizing about why kids are not learning. And they use the evidence that they collect to see if they're making progress. And if they are, then they move on to what's next. If they're not, they, find, they try something else. That's got to be the spirit with which public schools operate. Very few do, but if you go to Union City, you'll recognize it. Finally, you have to do all of this respecting the capacity of young kids and their teachers. And we all know this. You can't walk into a classroom of four-year-olds and not leave with this thought in your head. What could possibly go wrong with these kids? Wherever you are, however poor they may be, you can't believe that anything ever bad is going to happen to these kids. They are just as bright and curious and cheerful and energetic and, and questing as the four-year-old you'll find any place. And so you have to, and we do not sufficiently respect their capacity to learn. We, so we want to use just small words. We don't want to introduce them to large words, and we don't. And we don't do enough of it. That's why it's so complicated and hard to be a teacher of three and four year old kids who are poor. And that's what has got to be recognized. I'll give you a quick story. I was in Union City a week ago Friday. There were four year olds on the rug. The teacher was reading a story about Easter. And she said, uh, what's a bunny? And somebody said, well, it's a rabbit. And she said, is a bunny a rabbit? And one of the kids said, well, I don't think so. I think a bunny is a young rabbit. That's pretty good, right? I, I think a bunny is a young rabbit. And the teacher said, well, are there other animals where that's true, where you use one word to describe the young animal, but a different word to describe? And the, another kid pipes up, well, yeah, we got a dog at home. But when we first had the dog, it was a puppy. Oh, yeah. And then we have a cat. And it was, we used to call it kitty. And then they finally got bear and cup, and then they moved on. It was that moment that said, hey, these kids can do more. We can use this story about a bunny to ask them to start thinking about comparisons, about all sorts of other things. And it worked. And I had one other idea. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you this. In a different, in a second grade classroom, what, how old is a second grader? Seven years old? Seven. Second grade classroom. Here's how I find out whether a school works or not. And I'm not an expert at it. I ask kids what they're doing, why they're doing it. I ask the teacher, why are these kids doing this? What do you hope to get from this? So I go up to this kid. He's got a book open. I said, what are you reading? He says, well, I'm reading this book. What's, you know, as if to say, well, what's it look like I'm doing, right? So I said, oh, great. What's that about? He says, well, if you're interested in what it's about, let me read to you this particularly difficult passage. Now, this is a seven-year-old kid saying, let me read to you this particularly difficult passage. In Union City, New Jersey, the poorest city in, the, in uh, New Jersey, the most densely populated. 